it's time to uh, get started on our uh, closing plenary. And uh, before getting to the main event, I would be terrifically remiss not to thank several folks. Um, so I'm going to ask you to join me in doing that. First off, I want to thank all of the speakers. Um, I, I went to some incredible breakout sessions at this. Um, and I hope you found some too. I really thought it was just an extraordinarily um, good and diverse um, uh, set of breakouts. And um, I am deeply grateful to all of the people who came and put time and effort into making us all collectively a good deal uh, wiser now than we were when we arrived. Thank you. Second, I would like to thank uh, some volunteers um, from Georgetown, as well as uh, uh, Diane uh, Goldenberg Hart's daughter, um, who, who's not from Georgetown, um, who helped out with some of the audiovisual capture. Um, in recent years, as many of you know, we've tried to really expand the amount of um, uh, the number of sessions that we capture um, audio uh, uh, over PowerPoint. And um, there are too many of them for us to do by ourselves. So um, in recent meetings, we've been greatly helped and our whole community has been greatly helped by having um, a, a group of volunteers to assist us with that. So I thank them very much. And finally, um, I just want to say a thank you, a big thank you to the staff. You know, um, they really uh, did a tremendous job making this run smoothly. This is our first time in this hotel, and so there was lots of things to, you know, learn and sort out and debug and. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we, we got a few things not quite right, and we'll get those right next year and mess up some new ones. But, um, you know, overall, uh, I have to say this just went amazingly smoothly, and I really thank them for their hard work in uh, making it look easy. Thank you. Now, on to the main reason you're here because um, you're not here to listen to me thank people. So, in 1996, Paul Evan Peters, um, the founding director of CNI, died suddenly and unexpectedly. And as we came to that, to grips with that, um, a number of people wanted to do something in his memory, and um, there were two uh, things established. One is a scholarship which funds um, uh, a um, master's student and a doctoral student um, in a school of information or library science program. The other was the Paul Evan Peters Award, and um, oh. That is, that was funded by ARL, Educause, Microsoft, and Xerox. And um, we have given about, um, I think you're gonna be the sixth, if my memory serves, um, of these, uh, one every couple of years. And they really recognize, you know, deep, significant, and sustained excellence in some area that's really changed the, you know, been a major game changer um, for all of us. Uh, the people who have gotten this award are all, you know, very distinguished. They've had amazing careers, um, and uh, Herbert is no exception, um, except in one particular, I think, well, two particulars. Um, I think he's still got a lot of amazing career ahead of him. 
Um, and uh, also, he really, I think, is genuinely the first of a new generation who um, did their work largely after Paul had gone. Um, uh, I think you can see at least, you know, the beginnings of the effects of uh, and contributions of all the prior awardees um, uh, in Paul's time. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, Herbert really is, is the first of a new generation of, um, of important leaders to be recognized, and that gives me a lot of uh, pleasure, too. You have in this nice little brochure here a good picture and a biography of um, some of um, Herbert's contributions. Um, I would just say two things about um, those contributions. They're well enumerated in, in the text here. Uh, the first is that many of the people we've recognized have done sort of one good thing um, that was a very good thing um, and that had a lasting effect. Herbert has had one of the most, um, you know, fertile careers um, that I can imagine. Uh, you know, he has just continued from one fabulous achievement to another and indeed built one on top of the other in a, in a very um, uh, creative way. Uh, and, um, you know, people who can do that um, are, are very special. Um, most of us would be, I think, quite happy to have one really good idea. Um, so uh, that's one of the reasons I say somehow I think you've still got a lot of wonderful things ahead as well as behind you. Um, I also take great pleasure in this because in a certain way I, I've really watched, you know, Herbert's career take off. I had a really, you know, wonderful, unusual privilege of being an external um, member of his thesis defense for his doctorate at the University of Ghent. And that was probably the, time, the first time I really got to know him pretty well. Um, and, you know, I've just been following his work ever since. Um, and, and so uh, it's, it's given me great joy to watch that whole trajectory. Um, with that, uh, I um, ask you to join me in congratulating Herbert and, uh, as is traditional with the winners of the uh, Paul Evan Peters Award, um, he will uh, close the conference with a, um, with a lecture um, in Paul's memory. So, congratulations. Thanks a lot, Cliff, for your very kind words. And thanks also to CNI for uh, all the support that it has given uh, all my projects uh, over the years. So this presentation, Cliff, has been on my mind for numerous months, well, ever since you've actually sent me that email announcing that I had received the award and would I be willing to accept it? Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, but thanks a lot uh, for that, of course. Um, I want to express uh, a few thanks uh, in general uh, also uh, for uh, you know, people that have helped me uh, achieve uh, where I am now. First of all, of course, thank you to uh, those that have nominated me and those that have uh, endorsed uh, the nomination. I want to say a special word of thanks to the two people that uh, initially brought me uh, to the US in the context of the PhD research that Cliff actually uh, refers to. And those were uh, Diana Markin, then uh, at CLEAR, and Rick Luce, then at uh, Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory. They started this uh, enormous 20-year uh, uh, adventure uh, for me. I also, and this may sound unusual, uh, I also would like to thank my employer, the Los Alamos National Laboratory, 
As many of you, I'm sure, know that working for the federal government is not all that easy, big understatement. Uh, but then again, I've been given uh, enormous opportunities uh, at the lab, despite all the constraints, and I'm not sure that I would have found another institution in which I would have been able to develop my research agenda in the same kind of way. This award means uh, a lot to me because I consider it to be the highest uh, recognition that I can uh, receive uh, from this very community that I've been active in uh, for all these years. I need to, with that regard, thank all those people that I've collaborated with over the years, and of course I'm not going to thank them all individually. So what I did here is I created this virtual trophy <laughs> that I <coughs> offered them. And what you see here is a word cloud, and it's actually based on uh, all the co-authors and all the titles of my publications and specifications that I've created over the years. Clearly, this doesn't list all uh, the people that I've collaborated with, but definitely those that have had the highest, uh, the biggest impact on the direction of my work. This award means especially uh, a lot to me because three people that have inspired my work most over these past two decades have previously received uh, this award. That's Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the web, a fundamentally new communication medium. That's Paul Ginspark of the Physics Preprint Archive, actually initially known as xxx.lanel.gov. <coughs> he, early on, actually in the days before the web, understood that digital network technology was able to fundamentally transform scholarly communication. And then the third one is uh, Brewster Kale, of course the creator of the Internet Archive, who early on, in the very early days of the web, understood that the communication medium was going to be so important that it just had to be archived. Interestingly, my work is actually situated on the connection between all these people. On the axis that connects Tim and Paul, you have all the work I've done regarding interoperability for scholarly communication. On the axis between Tim and Brewster, you have the memento-related work, basically added the time dimension to the web and integrated web archives into the fabric uh, of the web, turned them into infrastructure rather than uh, into destinations. And then on the connection between Brewster and Paul, have my quest to try and use web archival paradigms to archive the scholarly record. That itself, this notion itself, pioneered by Locks and uh, David Rosenthal. So I'm ready to start the talk now, and the talk will be about scholarly communication, obviously, and the decentralized web. <clears throat> and I'll first uh, talk a little bit about what the decentralized web is all about. I then will motivate why I considered it relevant to apply or try to apply decentralized web concepts to scholarly communication. I will then share some inspirations that I picked up uh, out there related to this quest, and then I will end with some very bold uh, speculations. As a matter of fact, a lot of that, a lot actually of what I will touch upon is big sky thinking, and I would like to invite you to sit back and relax and you just join me in this uh, speculation. Forget for a moment about that report that you need to submit to the provost next week or that library system that you need to get off the ground in the first quarter of next year. Just come along, follow the line of thought, and dream with me about a potential future that will most likely never exist. So the decentralized web. So first of all, I mean, you all know the web is inherently uh, decentralized, a distributed uh, system. But still, a couple of things happened uh, so that there's some kind of a movement that have, uh, has emerged uh, that is trying to re-decentralize uh, the web. 
to be honest, uh, this was the topic uh, that I chose to pursue in my sabbatical. And I didn't find it all that easy to come by concise uh, information, descriptions of what this all was about. And I had to really dig myself into technical specifications, white papers and all, to try and understand from the technicalities what uh, this was all about. In case you are interested in this, beyond what I will uh, share with you today, I highly recommend a set of videos that were recorded uh, as part of the Decentralized Web Summit that Bruce Kale organized about a year ago at the uh, Internet Archive. There's uh, a lot of uh, good stuff there. The thing is that there are really uh, two strands <clears throat> going on in this uh, decentralized uh, web work. They, they share a concern, and it's a, a concern about the enormous uh, power and control that certain nodes on the web have established when it comes to access to information, privacy, censorship. It's concerned with a single point of failures also. And so there's the two first uh, on uh, the slide there, distributed uh, file systems and blockchain, they're all about uh, tackling uh, these challenges by introducing new protocols, okay? They're also concerned with building archiving and trust into the very fabric of uh, the network. This is pretty interesting. <clears throat> I have, uh, and there's actually really interesting work going on also specifically related to research and scholarly communication. I decided not to pursue this path because of the fact that it builds on totally from scratch protocols. And I thought understanding that scholarly communication hardly has even adopted the ways of the web, I thought, you know, maybe starting really from scratch is a bit uh, a stretch uh, too far. So that's why I decided to dig deeper into this other thread, which more follows along with the lines of the web and is based on the HTTP uh, protocol. This is work mostly coming out of uh, the W3C, actually. Uh, it's exemplified by the MIT SOLID project, which I will uh, talk uh, a bit more uh, about later. <clears throat> so, the, this, this track that I studied finds its origin in one of these legendary notes that Tim Berners-Lee puts out every now and then, you know, like there was the one about linked data. And so this one is called socially aware uh, cloud storage. And the consideration there is that over the past, let's say, decade, <clears throat> uh, the web has become dominated by a couple of massive uh, portals. Uh, I don't really need to name them, but I will. Facebook, Twitter, Google, and so on. And so these portals, and there's of course way more, these portals offer a very smooth service. It's free at the point of use, you know, but it comes of course with the consequence that the user, the user's behavior, the user's information is obviously the product uh, that is uh, being uh, sold. It comes with a couple of other uh, problems that come from this monopolistic uh, kind of nature of these portals. The user has no mobility. It is not possible for the user to pick up its data from one of these portals and just uh, drop it uh, in another. There's hardly or no interoperability between these systems. They have their own APIs, if they even have them, but they don't really interoperate. <clears throat> And then another aspect is that the functionality that is provided by these portals is typically constrained to the resources within these portals. So it's not like you can apply the functionality that comes with one of these portals and take it over here and apply it to resources in another portal. So there's this uh, kind of connection uh, between uh, these things. So this note about Tim Berners-Lee is really a, a call to arms to put the user back in the driver's seat. And doing this by basically giving every user their own web environment in which they self-publish their information and where they have total control of their own information. It also comes with the notion of disconnecting between the application and the content. And so it 
the, it's the notion where an application can exist, typically browser side, and it can work with information that sits there on different uh, kind of pods. <clears throat> and it is up to the user to grant access to their own information. And this is done by means of web-based access uh, control lists. So as I mentioned, all of this work is exemplified by the MIT uh, SOLID project. And without going into technical details, I want to illustrate by means of a scenario what the essence of the ideas really is. So I need you to listen very carefully to this, because if you're not along with this, you won't understand anything of the rest of the presentation. <laughs> so the idea here is literally that the user has their own web domain. So here's Alice, and she owns alice.info. Uh, and in that web domain, she publishes a profile. It's a machine-readable profile that lists some of her personal information. For example, what is her preferred web identifier, and what are her contacts on the web, also expressed in terms of uh, web identifiers. Now, in that domain, Alice runs her own storage environment. And it's called a pod, P-O-D. I will mention that term uh, a lot in the, the coming minutes here. So she operates that pod. And that pod is actually, you have to think about it as it's a web server on steroids. So it obviously, it offers storage of Alice's personal information, but it also comes with authentication and authorization. And there's also a social component to this by means of this inbox. So there's an inbox where Alice can receive notifications from others uh, on the network. Now, with regard to authentication, it's not like we need to give every user in the world a username in Alice's pod. The idea for authentication is it's a global mechanism. And once the mechanism is implemented, it can be used across different of these uh, pod systems. Okay? So it's not one of these portals where everyone needs to go and get their own login uh, account. So as I mentioned, there's also these applications. They typically run in the browser. And Alice runs one of these. The application interacts with the pod, so it supports all the standards that are supported by the pod. And using that application, she creates a document, and she publishes it in her pod. She decides to make this public by use of these access control lists, and now it's visible on the web at a certain URL. Now, in comes Bob. And Bob actually reads, he discovers, and he reads the document that was published by uh, Alice. Now, Bob has also drank the Kool-Aid of pods. And so he also owns his own domain, and he publishes his own profile, and he runs a pod. Now, this isn't necessarily the same pod. It could be another implementation, but it's the pod that has the same functionalities, and it supports the same standards. And Bob also has his preferred application to write textual information, and he uses it to write a comment to the posting that Alice did. And he publishes it also on the web in his own pod. And this is where it becomes interesting, because we now have Alice's document and Bob's command to Alice's document. And these things are not connected. One thing that we've gained here is that both Alice and Bob are completely in control of their own information. But the information is not connected, so we need to solve that. Well, one part of the equation is very simple, of course. When Bob writes his comment about Alice's posting, obviously he's going to link to it. So that piece is solved. Now, for the other part, this is where the inbox notion comes in. Remember, Alice has a machine-readable profile. And in that profile, you find information about the location of her storage environment, but also of the location of her inbox. And so Bob's application figures that information out and can now send a notification to Alice's inbox 
basically saying, hey, I wrote the command about your stuff. And if all is well, that then allows Alice to link back to Bob's command. And as in the end state, basically we have these things that are bidirectionally linked, but both of these parties have retained control of their own information. Now when I say there is a link from Alice's document to Bob's comment, that can just be a link, but that could also be that every time that Alice's document is rendered, Bob's comment is dynamically inserted as a comment into that document. Bottom line remains the same. They both remain in charge of their own information. That's a bit of the core idea behind this thinking, Tim Berners-Lee's thinking about his uh, decentralized web thread. As I said, these pods are web servers on steroids. They support rewrite, delete operations, authentication, authorization, and all of that is based on standards. So for example, for rewrite, delete, it's linked data platform. When it comes to identity, it's web ID and friend of a friend. Uh, authentication, web ID, TLS, open ID connect, and access control list for authorization uh, purposes. So, Bob's and Alice's pod can be different implementations, but they all support this standard. Same thing when it comes to uh, notifications. That is also standard-based, and there's a spec called linked data notifications that is being used there, and as a payload of the notifications, which are structured, by the way, and machine uh, processable, uh, activity streams too could be used. Again, another uh, uh, W3C standard. So, when you put all of that together, an ecology emerges or can emerge that looks uh, a bit like this. So you have all these figureheads here, they all have their own pod. And because they self-publish in their own pod environments, you end up with a document network that is obviously has interconnected documents, just like on the web in general. But in addition to that, because of these inboxes, there's a social network component that is being added on top of these storage environments. And this is something that's going to be making it very interesting for what I'll talk about when applying these ideas to scholarly communication, because this is actually the component where we, one could introduce discipline-specific uh, connections. So, I started reading about this decentralized web movement and thought, well, it would be interesting to kind of see where we end up if we apply these ideas to scholarly communication. And actually had two rational motivations that decided me to really go there. First of all, the web, as Tim Berners-Lee describes it in his note on socially aware cloud storage, and the scholarly web have at least one thing in common, and that's monopolies of big players. And then the other thing is that when looking back <clears throat> at the Republic of Letters, when scholars were literally sending letters to each other, expressing their ideas or expressing feedback to their peers' ideas, one is actually reminded that scholarly communication is an inherently social activity. And I think we've forgotten a little bit about that through the industrialization of scholarly communication and through the introduction of a whole bunch of intermediaries between author A and author B. So these were the two rational motivations that made me decide, yeah, why don't you go look into that? And then there was a third one, which is not all that rational, it's way more emotional, and it's my deep frustration with the status quo of scholarly communication and with the fact that in the past two decades that we've all worked very hard to try and introduce change, we haven't actually, in my opinion, achieved an awful lot. Just two illustrations about that. Throughout my entire career, starting as a systems librarian at Ghent University, until now, working as an information scientist at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, this, the serial crisis, has been with me, has followed me along. 
This is not a crisis. This is a very unfortunate reality. And then there's this. It doesn't even really need a lot of explanation. I have said things along these same lines for about 10 or more years. So I thought, why don't I let someone else say it for once? And so this is John Tennant at the recent conference, who's basically sending the message that we all know, yeah, scholarly communication is extremely slow at adopting the techniques of the document web, the social web, and the semantic web. Now, it's not like we've not been told that it could be different. I already referred to Paul Ginspark, but there were others in the mid-90s already that told us that the then new digital network technologies were able to fundamentally transform scholarly communication. These people understood that with these new technologies, it was not essential to fulfill the core functions of scholarly communication in a vertically integrated manner. They understood that registration, certification, discovery, and archiving could be handled separately and could be under control of different parties. And you see this illustrated in this depiction. This is uh, done by Paul Ginspark somewhere, I think, yeah, 2001. And there are two things that are really important here. First of all, the decoupling of registration from certification by means of the publication of preprints, obviously. And you see that in this picture at the bottom layer, actually Paul refers to it as data, you know, stuff, preprints that are posted in both discipline and institutional repositories. And that being decoupled from what he calls here the knowledge layer, it's where the certification, the peer review is applied, which here is instantiated uh, by means of journals. So that's one thing that we can do with the new technologies. And then the other thing that's important here is that this bottom layer, this data layer, can be made freely available for all without any charge. This vision, however logical and beautiful it may seem, didn't really generally happen in the last uh, two decades. I still think this is the real way to go because it is the model that provides us with the guarantee that the raw information is available for free of all to use, and there's a guarantee that we can, in an unhindered way, build added value on top of this raw layer, both commercial and free added value. So while decoupling from reg of registration from certification didn't happen, a couple of other things happened in the past two decades. Open access happened. So I don't consider open access a paradigm shift, but it, it's really an effort to find new business models to keep doing the same, with a very laudable goal, by the way, of providing free access to information to more people. And as a result of this movement, obviously, we have more unhindered access to scholarly papers. A very good thing. There's also other consequences, though, of this uh, movement. I came across this really interesting paper coming out of the UK. And what the authors are trying to do here is to figure out the money stream of research funding and you see the research funders in the UK at the left-hand side uh, of this picture, flowing through institutions, which you see in the middle of this picture, going towards uh, the publishers, which you see at the right-hand side of this picture. <clears throat> and so one of the findings of the authors is that it's actually extremely hard to combine this kind of information, to quantify these flows financially. And hence they say, well, if we can't really understand how much money is flowing from research funding to the publishers, how can we even speculate about novel ways to do scholarly communication? The reason I'm showing this, of course, is that there's a new stream of money flowing uh, to publishers. At the bottom of the circle there, you see your typical subscriptions, you know, that are, you know, being paid to publishers. And on top, 
as you all know, we have these new article processing charges, a new uh, money stream that flows from research funding uh, to the publishers. Now, if all of these APCs were about truly open access publishing, you know, then all would be good. We would indeed have more open access. But it turns out, and this comes from another paper, that a lot of these APCs actually go to hybrid journals, where there's both subscription fees and APCs that are being charged. And this trend is actually on the rise. So we're putting a lot more new money, actually, into this system. Another thing that happened, and that has partly been discussed uh, during uh, this CNI meeting, is that the established players in the scholarly communication system have actually increased their grip on the entire system. And you see that in the acquisition of established players, by established players, of innovative venues for publishing, analytics, the research process, and so on. You also see it in the increased competition that institutional repositories face from research information systems. This is going on big time in Europe currently. And then the other thing that's really important is that the action radius of these established players has significantly increased from their original function as a publisher of content and way into the whole research enterprise. So I just give you this illustration. This pertains to Elsevier, but this is not at all only about Elsevier. And this shows how the initial business of Elsevier, which you see in the middle there, the publishing business, you know, uh, has now extended and Elsevier has tools to offer throughout the research enterprise. You see that at the left uh, of this picture and also in research evaluation. So that is really as a result of buying a lot of tools, buying an analytic capabilities, and buying a lot of uh, content. And then one more thing happened that is really relevant for this presentation, and I've myself talked about this at previous uh, CNI meetings. Increasingly, the research process, not only the outcome of research, is visible uh, on the web. There's as a result of that, a dramatic extension of the scholarly record with a wide variety of artifacts. And as we move more towards open science, this is actually going to happen even more. Now, these artifacts are deposited by our researchers in a wide variety of portals all over the web. And the researchers flock to these kind of portals because you know, they get good exposure there, collaboration facilities, and so on. But the bottom line is that these materials are actually leaving our institutions, the institutions where they were initially created, and they are not being archived because these kind of companies, these kind of portals, the last thing they focus in is on archiving the scholarly record. They offer other kind of uh, functionality. So I hope that with this, I have adequately motivated why I thought and think it's still interesting to explore new possibilities for scholarly communication, new paradigms, new uh, technologies, and so on. And I frame this quest really in terms of trying to achieve the scholarly commons. And with that regard, this little bit in red here that comes from the Force 11 uh, principles on scholarly communication is really core. How can we achieve a scholarly commons that is sustainable for the long run, fulfills the core functions of scholarly communication, and while doing that really doesn't forget about the archival bit? And we'll spend the rest of this talk you know, dwelling on these questions. And I'll consider a technical component where I feel very well at ease. I will formulate ideas that are inspired by, you know, me looking into uh, the decentralized web movement. And then I'll also touch upon an organizational component in which I will provide pointers to stuff of others that uh, it is about thinking of organizational principles or foundations for a scholarly commons. All right, 
So here we go with the technical inspiration. So while I was exploring the decentralized uh, web uh, movement, I came across the work of uh, this person here, Sarvan Kapadisli. He's a PhD student at Bonn University. He's a big fan of Marshall McLuhan. And he's probably uh, equally enthusiastic about trying to change scholarly communication like I was about 20 years ago. <laughs> so as part of his uh, PhD work, he has implemented uh, this tool, an, a scholarly editor really, that is called uh, Dokili. And so Dokili is a client-side application that fits in this whole framework that I explained. It can interact with these pods. Okay, and so it gives you editing capability, but it also gives you this social connection uh, capability by means of uh, the inboxes. It exists either as a browser extension or as JavaScript that is embedded in HTML pages. And it supports all these standards that I've mentioned before that a pod environment typically supports. But in addition to that, it supports a whole range of standards that are pertinent to scholarly communication. So for example, it supports web annotation, it supports Creative Commons licenses, uh, Cito, which is about semantic citation, Provo, which is about province expressions, and so on. As I said, it's an editor. It allows one to edit HTML and RDF without actually knowing that you're editing HTML and RDF, so it's all uh, menu-driven. And it's a platform for social interaction. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you, I'm going to walk you through a little scenario, and I'm not going to dwell on the editor capabilities because I don't think those are most crucial for this conversation. Uh, I'm going to dwell into the social interaction stuff. So what you see here at the left-hand side is a paper that Sarvan wrote and self-published in his own pod. And then at the right-hand side, you see a little menu system that pops up when you open the Dokili extension. You see here, or you don't, but there's a little picture there. This means that Sarvan is currently logged on to his pod environment. So he just put this paper out there, and he said, well, you know, I would like a few people to review this. And so he says, oh, I'm going to click the share button. And he clicks the share button. And as a result of that, I see a new uh, menu system. And that gets automatically populated with Sarvan's contacts. Those are extracted from his friend of a friend profile. So there's Tim Berners-Lee there. I am there. And Ruben Verborg from Ghent is there and a few other people. And Sarvan says, OK, Herbert, Ruben, why don't you guys uh, review my paper? And he sends out this notification to our inbox, which, of course, are dynamically discovered via our uh, profiles. I received this notification in my inbox. And if this looks geeky, well, it's because it is. All of this is. Okay? <laughs> but the message is clear. Uh, this message comes from actor Sarvan Kapadisli. You see his web ID up there. It's about an object called linked uh, specification reports. So that's the paper he wrote. And there's uh, you know, a message there. Would you please want to uh, review this? Uh, of course, I'm willing to review this. And the way I go about this, and this is really interesting, I think, is I'm not going to write a document all by myself, stand off from Sarvan's paper. I'm actually, in this case here, going to Sarvan's website, you know, following the link that he just sent me, and I'm going to create a derivation copy of his paper. So I am logged into my pod environment now, as you can see, because my icon is up there, and I click Save As. This pops up a document. And I can express there where in my own personal environment I want to save Sarvan's paper, because I want to express my review on top of that. As a result of that, a copy of the paper was created in my own environment. And you see the URL uh, down there. So you're clearly now in my pod environment. What is really interesting here is that I have not only made a copy, I've actually, in doing this, also recorded the provenance. You see there in red that this was derived from a paper in Sarvan's pod and at which day this was done. 
So now that I have this copy in my own environment, I go about my, you know, my reviewing business, I edit, I comment, I annotate, okay? And when I'm ready, I'm going to use exactly the same mechanism to inform Sarvan that this thing, my review, is now available. So I click share, Sarvan pops up, you know, from my friend of a friend list, and I send a notification, you know, good paper, but a few changes need to be made. Please publish a new version. And then Sarvan receives the notification. Again, the information is now about my review of his paper, and it expresses my web identifier at the bottom there. Maybe you can't read it, but it's expressed as my ORCID identifier, and the message is indeed sent to uh, Sarvan. So I find this uh, remarkably uh, interesting, a completely new way, really, of doing things, all in function of self-publishing your papers, self-publishing your reviews in your personal environments. <clears throat> and all of this, again, a document network overlaid with this social network that can be uh, discipline-based. There's quite a few significant, actually, technical challenges that really need to be tackled to move this idea like Dokili to something that could be production ready. That's in the realm of authentication amongst other. And we recently worked uh, with Sarvan, my team worked with him, on uh, integrating authentication with ORCID actually, using the ORCID uh, OpenID Connect. So basically one can use this environment, uh, a totally decentralized publication approach with a central piece of infrastructure that this community uh, provided, like ORCID. There's also problems with versioning because linked data platform itself doesn't uh, support that. But I don't want to dwell on that because there's really interesting conceptual questions, really, that when you think about the self-publishing model, how are you going to fulfill the core functions of scholarly communication? Registration, certification, awareness, and archiving. And I can't touch upon all of this, but again, I will show you what I mean, what the challenges are, or illustrate, by means of a scenario. So here's Alice again. And she's working on a new paper, and she creates working draft one, working draft two, and then she decides, yep, this is ready now, I'm going to self-publish it. In terms of the scholarly record, this really means that she has registered a new paper, a new finding into the scholarly record. <clears throat> There's two really interesting aspects just in this one picture already. First of all, clearly we need the semantic distinction between those working drafts and the paper that Alice considers published so that we as readers or machines would understand Alice actually considers this a published uh, paper. The second thing is, since the registration is concerned, we actually want to know that past registration, Alice doesn't tamper with this information. And this is, of course, where a self-publishing model differs significantly from submitting to a preprint archive or to a publisher, because in those cases, the paper is out of your hands, you can't really tamper with it anymore, and the date stamp of priority has been given. In this case here, because Alice is completely in control of her own information, of her own pod, she can tamper as much as she wants with this post-publication. So a way to ameliorate this problem, and this is just speculation, is to actually combine registration with archiving. Archiving has to be done anyhow, remember? So here's the idea. Let's just imagine there is such a thing like a scholarly archive. And so when the, at the moment that Alice decides she's actually going to register her new paper in the scholarly record, a notification is sent to that scholarly archive, obviously with the URL of that publication, and now the archive is in business to pull that in and archive uh, the paper. So we now have gained two things if we proceed this way. We have the ability to verify that Alice hasn't tampered with her paper post-publication by comparing the live and the archived copy. And what we also have is that if Alice decides to leave academia, 
she can actually, I mean, we can actually find a copy in the archive. Now, same thing actually applies uh, when one publishes a review, like in this case here, Bob and uh, Carol publish reviews to Alice's paper. This also really considers new registrations in the scholarly record, and as a result, the same mechanism could be used to archive uh, these materials. There's another piece of work that has caught my eye as I was exploring decentralized web work. <clears throat> and this is the work by Amy Gee. She recently uh, received her PhD from the University of Edinburgh Informatics Department. And if you don't know what you're looking at here, well, I didn't know either initially. <clears throat> but it turns out that this is actually her website and that each of these little squares that you see are actually activities that Amy conducted as she went by her life, okay? And so, for example, when I click that one little square there, which has a little money uh, bucket on it, I actually get to see one of these personal activities. And we can see here that Amy bought some food, uh, vegan food, I need to add, uh, at Luton Airport, and she actually spent five and a half uh, British pounds for that. This is pretty weird, but this is actually <laughs> a thing. <clears throat> this is actually called a personal web observatory. And this is all about tracking your daily activities by using a wide variety of web portals out there. So uh, Amy has accounts in a wide variety of these things that all track certain aspects of her life. For example, buying food, traveling, walking, biking, and so on and so on. And they're all uh, different portals. And so her website, the system that she runs, which is called Slav, actually interconnects with these systems, uh, uses API approaches, a variety of techniques to pull information from all these portals into her own environment. And as a result, she builds some kind of an event store that tracks the activities of her life. And so the website is a depiction of that event store. And the event store, of course, can uh, also be queried. I was new to this. I hadn't heard about this. But it turns out this is actually really a thing. Okay, And uh, there's a whole movement called the quantified self movement. And they engage in these kind of things. For example, for the purpose of starting to lead a healthier life. So they bring all that information into their central environment, their own environment. They run analytics on top of it. And then they say, oh, if I do this, this, and that, then uh, the outcome will be a healthier me. There's also the Locker Project. And that was all about uh, assets, artifacts, that people are dropping all over the web because they like the way these portals behave and all, but in the end, they also want it in, under their own control. And so they use all these APIs, connectors, they call it, to bring the information in. If you have been listening carefully, you should probably by now know why I was so interested in this. Remember these artifacts that our scholars leave all over the web in all these productivity portals? these things that are leaving our institutions and that are not archived? Well, Amy's work actually provides inspiration for something that would call, one could call a personal scholarly web observatory, where one actually traces the activities, the artifacts that scholars drop, individuals drop all over the web, and where information about these new artifacts is automatically collected in a personal environment of that scholar. In addition to that, not only information about the artifacts themselves could be collected, also information about the interactions that peers have with these artifacts could be collected. And I'm sure that an awful lot of really neat analytics could be run uh, on top of that. But that's not my major motivation to look into that. My major motivation really is to get hold of that artifact URI so that somehow we can collect and archive uh, the artifact. So my team has started to 
you know, rudimentary explore this notion of a personal scholarly web observatory, and they used me uh, as my subject. <clears throat> And so what you see here, well, what we did is uh, we tracked my artifacts in the real scholarly record by means of my DBLP uh, profile. Uh, also my artifacts in SlideShare and in GitHub. And what you see at the left-hand side is that I have way more papers than I have presentations. And I have very little activity in uh, GitHub, actually. And then on the right-hand side, you see interactions by peers with the artifacts uh, I put out there. And here we use, in order to collect that, we use the SlideShare API, the GitHub API, and then when it comes to my publications, uh, we use MS Academic for citations, and we use the Crossref event data for uh, references in non-scholarly environments. So I kind of like what I see here, because this gives an integrated view of my activities. Not only the things that are traditionally considered scholarly, but the things that I really consider scholarly uh, myself. So that I find interesting. It also is interesting because we are tracing stuff here not because they have a DOI, like we do with uh, alt metrics and with citations, but because I created them. It's on the basis of I have an identity in all of these portals. That's why these things are now being traced. And then the third thing that this shows, I mean, you see that the amount of interactions with my slides are so much more humongous than with my papers. That basically means I shouldn't write papers anymore. This is another visualization. It's a heat map. It's done on the top of the same kind of uh, event uh, database that we collected about myself. Uh, it shows both creation of new artifacts and uh, others interacting with those artifacts. And then the big white spot uh, that you see there is because a lot of these APIs don't allow you to go a long time back in time. But going forward, you could obviously uh, fill uh, this all up. So this is where I leave the technical domain, and I veer into a domain that I have no clue about, really, uh, which is uh, organizational uh, matters. That's your forte, actually. What I have observed, though, is that there is a very strong sentiment living currently in many quarters that academic institutions should take back control of scholarly publishing and of the scholarly record. And one of the recent indications I've seen of that is this posting by uh, Shan Sutton, which really is a call to arms. It's actually co-authored with uh, a group of very prominent uh, library deans and directors. And it's a call to arms uh, regarding the establishment of an ac academy-owned uh, scholarly communication system where access to publications is for free, and eventually the act of publishing itself is also for free. So the idea here is that academic institutions, libraries, will actually provide and sustain the infrastructure for a future scholarly communication system, something like the scholarly commons. These ideas are also expressed in this short paper by uh, David Lewis. And he gets actually concrete, and he says all academic libraries should spend 2.5% of their budget on deploying and sustaining such infrastructure. And then there's Bjorn Brems, by many considered an extremist voice when it comes to thinking about future scholarly communication systems. In my opinion, a man with quite a few uh, good insights. And for years, he has been shouting off the rooftops that it is academic institutions that should provide the in infrastructure for scholarly communication. He actually compares providing or investing in that infrastructure with the investments academic institutions made decades ago in network infrastructure. And he says, when these institutions made the, these investments, they really didn't know what the outcome was going to be either. But they did it, and it turned out to be really great uh, that they did. Bjorn goes actually one step further, because he says that we have a one to two year window now 
where most of the papers are available to anyone to grab, thanks to Sci-Hub. And he says, we just should all cancel our subscriptions and use the money that becomes available and invest that in initial infrastructure for scholarly communication. That's probably where the extremism comes in. <laughs> Shan Sutton's uh, posting <clears throat> explicitly talks about two paths you know, for the future, two kind of approaches uh, to achieve the scholarly commons. One is the inherently discipline-oriented preprint servers with a reference to the centralized uh, OSF preprint uh, platform. Preprints on the rise, very good news. And the other is institution-based uh, repositories with a reference to the next generation repository report by CORE. I actually contributed uh, myself to this report. This report has a very strong emphasis on interoperability because the vision that is being brought forward is that of institutional repositories, uh, as many nodes in the network, but together forming the basis of a new scholarly communication system. And one can only achieve that when there's deep uh, interoperability between uh, these systems. So what I've told you thus far really raises the question of, could there be a third track? Do we need to keep open minds? Could there be such a thing as an other publishing model based on these ideas of self-publishing? So I'm going to call it for now the researcher pod. I'm going to explore this idea. And this is where I veer into total speculation, OK? So you see here the researcher pod, and it consists like of two main components. At the right-hand side, the communication platform, and that's the thing that's inspired by MIT Solid and Dokili. And then on the left-hand side, this notion of an artifact tracker, which is inspired by Amy Gee's work. This tracker, though, doesn't only track the artifacts that researchers leave out there in portals on the web, but also the things that authors are self-publishing in their pod environments. So all of that goes into this event store. Now, obviously, we cannot expect a researcher to operate their own pods. That's where you guys come in. So we're going to say that these pods are actually hosted by an institution. So every institution is going to host the scholarly pods of their respective uh, researchers. I volunteered you for that. I'm going to volunteer you for one more thing, actually. Sorry about that. I said I was going to speculate. The other thing is, of course, archiving. And I'm going to put that in the institution's lap also. I think there's a nice alignment with you know, the real task of libraries, of academic institutions, and archiving the scholarly records. So what we're going to do is, as this event store records information about new artifacts, we're going to send that information about these artifacts on to an archival process that is operated by institutions. And that archival process is going to collect one artifact after another and is going to dump it in the archive. So let's pull all of this together, first from the perspective of the researcher. So a researcher here in this paradigm has a personal domain for scholarly communication. One could actually say the researcher starts his life or her life as a researcher by acquiring a personal domain. It's not institution bound, it's truly personal, and I'll come to why uh, later on. The researcher pod is for scholarly activities and it operates in the domain. So this is truly the researcher taking responsibility for the publication of papers and reviews in their own environment. David Rosenthal and I had a conversation about this at, on the 411 list, and he says, in this kind of a paradigm, you achieve a level of persistence purely because of self-interest of uh, the scholar. So our pod has three functions, self-publishing of papers, overlay reviews, comments, and annotations, Notifications, which is where the discipline component comes in, okay? And then the self-tracking, keeping track of everything that the researcher is doing out there on the web by use of APIs, notification mechanisms, and so on. So 
this researcher pod, definitely this event store, eventually starts to provide a very comprehensive overview of all the contributions that this researcher makes and potentially of the interactions that the researcher's peer has with uh, these artifacts. The pods, because they support all these standards, are globally uh, interoperable. And the standards actually to achieve this exist. The tools are currently really brittle, and that's a massive uh, understatement based on my experience. And then there's the notion of institution enabled. So the institution provides a hosting platform and, of course, operational support so that the researchers can run their pods in those platforms. <clears throat> and the researcher's domain resolves to the institutional platform. And then the institutions also take care of the archival aspect of all via this mechanism uh, that I've explained. One could discuss what the exact nature or architecture of this archive should be, but there's several options uh, available. Now, one more exploration of this idea, and this pertains to the mobility of researchers and the persistence of the scholarly record. So here they are again. Alice and Carol work at institution A, and Bob works at institution B. And obviously, in this paradigm, they all operate their own uh, pods. And again, in this paradigm, whenever they create a new artifact, either out there on the web or in their pod, it automatically gets archived into the scholarly archive. Now, at one point, Alice decides to move over to institution B. Now, obviously, the stuff that was already archived while she's, she was at institution A remains in the archive. And then Alice, what, what does she do? Well, she just grabs her domain and she grabs her pod and she moves it along. It's portable. She moves it along to the new institution and she drops it there on the hosting platform and life is good again. She can just start self-publishing again. Obviously, everything that she now creates from within institution B gets archived again in the scholarly archive. It's just that now it's going to happen via processes at institution uh, B. Now, Carol decides to completely leave academia. She's had enough of it. And then, well, a couple of things can happen. Her employer, or Carol herself, can decide to keep this pod running, maybe not make any new contributions because the career, the research career is over. But whichever way, the materials that she created are in the scholarly archive. Or she could just completely give up on this pod and start a fundamentally new life. But again, her materials are sitting in the archive. And basically the same story if Bob goes belly up. Because his institution could say, well, you know, Bob is so important that we're going to keep his pod alive. Or, as again, David Rosenthal uh, suggested, well, Bob could actually have a will where he endowed his pod and his domain to keep on going for a while. Or again, of course, the pod could just totally disappear. But again, Bob's materials, his artifacts, are in the scholarly archive. <clears throat> now, persistence is not only about having archived the stuff. It's also about seamlessly being able to get to materials that sit in the archive. Remember, we've created the document network. And Alice's papers may point to Bob's artifacts. And we want these things to keep working you know, when they leave their pods behind, basically. So when Alice moves from institution A to B, there's not a problem because she holds on to her domain. So all the links just keep working. When Carol and Bob give up on their pod, we have developed technologies that actually allow us to follow these links that existed on the live web or that exist on the live web that would typically lead to 404s that now would directly and seamlessly lead into the web archive, the scholarly archive. And these technologies include PIDs and robust links that comes out of my team related to the Memento work. So in summary, 
One can think of these researcher pods as a different kind of institutional repository. It's contributor-centric instead of document-centric. So it offers something truly for the researcher. The disciplinary component that is missing really from institutional repositories is instantiated here by means of social network functionality overlaid on these self-publishing environments. There is, as I showed you, built-in portability, built-in uh, uh, mobility, and the thing is archive-ready if we have these event stores that communicate with an archival layer. And then in closing, it was really not my intention here to convince you that researcher pods are the way to go. I just wanted to illustrate that there are degrees of freedom beyond the notion of preprint repositories and institutional repositories that we might want to explore when deciding on creating the scholarly commons. Self-publishing as a concept may be too far removed from the current practice, although one can really trace it back to the ideas of Stephen Harnett in his subversive proposal, and even to the early days of the Republic of Letters. While it may not be really feasible, I think discussing it, contemplating it, still remains extremely interesting, because by understanding why it is not feasible, we may get new insights into what is actually feasible. And that could be uh, pretty enlightening. From a technical perspective, for the very first time in the two decades that I've worked on these kind of things, I feel confident that the standards, maybe not necessarily the tools, but at least the standards to deploy the scholarly commons really exist. And that's why I also voted 10 out of 10 on that very first question here that was, you know, it's a, a poll by Bianca Kramer that was issued at the recent Force uh, 11 uh, conference. Can the scholarly commons be realized with existing technology? My answer was 10 out of 10, yes. Technically, we can do this. So that leaves us with the organizational questions. Can academic institutions take global collective action to work towards funding, building, sustaining the scholarly commons? I'm afraid that I do not have the expertise to answer that question, but many in this room actually do. And so I hope that with this talk, I've given you a little bit of inspiration and I've given you a little nudge to taking concrete action with this regard. Thank you much. <laughs> Cliff, do we have time for a few questions, if there's any? One question? If there are any. I'm tired, so you don't have to feel obliged. <laughs> No, I don't see any questions, I think. OK. I think you have stretched people's thinking in so many fascinating directions. And I have to say, um, there is so much work you alluded to there that I'm unfamiliar with and want to go explore. And I suspect I speak for many people here. Um, I, I think you've given us an amazing amount of things to think about. And um, I, I really um, love where you ended this, which is this is a set of things to think about, not a blueprint. It points to possibilities that perhaps haven't been adequately considered. Exactly. Um, and those kinds of opening ups of possibilities are so valuable to us. I think you'll agree with me that the um, nominating committee for the Paul Evan Peters Award have picked 
an incredibly worthy awardee. I'd like to thank that committee. Um, their members are enumerated on the award brochure you have, and I won't take your time here. But especially, Herbert, I'd like to thank you, not just for this wonderful talk, um, which is such, uh, uh, Paul would have loved this, I, I, seriously, um, but for everything you've done for our community. Thank you so much. And with that, I wish you safe travels. I wish you good holidays and a good new year. And I hope to see lots of you in San Diego in the spring. Um, in between, we will get all of these uh, presentation slides and videos up as soon as we can, and we'll keep you posted on our progress on CNI Announce. Travel safe. Thank you. Thank you.